You want to know how I ended up here, foreigner? You dare ask such a question, as if we were equals? Very well. I will tell you the story, my companion in misfortune. If there is one thing of which we are not deprived in this bloody dungeon, it is time. I aimed for the throne, yet I ended up in this dark, moldy prison cell. Beyond these bars lies the land of my fathers, Lithuania. Its swamps, deep forests, and raging rivers are not exactly the heart of civilization, if you ask our enemies. Which makes it all the more astonishing that they have tried, time and again, to subjugate it. It began when some chosen ones felt called on to bring the light to Lithuania. They named themselves the Teutonic Order, and under the banner of the cross they promised deliverance, yet they brought only death and perdition. Lithuania was not easily cowed. Our ancestors learned how to fight by battling the forces of nature and the beasts of the dark primeval forests. Every one of our soldiers is steeped in that same tradition. But the more that we resisted the Crusaders and their god, the more ruthless they became. Slowly, we began to see their true faces. They called themselves holy warriors, but they were nothing more than robber knights. And a hundred years of pillaging our lands had made them masters of their trade. They raised our strongholds and torched our villages. Had Grand Duke Gedimina still been alive, he would have put this mob of greedy crusaders in its place. But a devious coup ended his life and left the throne to his useless son, Eunutis. Eunutis was weak, but worse, he was divisive when the land needed unity. He turned away from our old beliefs and accepted the Christian God. As he failed to control the domestic unrest, the Grand Master of the Teutonic Order saw his chance to subjugate Lithuania for good. However, Eunutis' brothers, Algirdas and Kestutis, refused to stand idly by as their beloved homeland fell to the cross. They exhorted the disaffected princes to dethrone Eunutis, who had barricaded himself inside of the Lithuanian capital of Vilnius. To seize power is one thing. To keep it is something else entirely. Only a fool declares himself the victor after winning the first battle of a war. As such, Algirdas and Kestutis, the victorious usurpers, knew that their triumph could turn out to be short-lived. The two of them, however, were a different breed than most rulers of their time. Instead of quarreling as their brothers had done, and as most people expected them to, for who had ever heard of two men sharing power? Algirdas and Kestutis agreed to rule Lithuania together. It was a remarkable move. And it showed that they cared more about the well-being of their subjects than personal power. This, of course, did not go unnoticed by the Teutonic Grand Master. He knew that he would have to contend with more formidable opponents from now on. Come to the East, do God's work, and be rewarded not only with nebulous concepts of salvation and eternity, but also with land and plunder. That was the promise of the Teutonic Order, and the reason that they could rely on a steady supply of battle-hungry knights. Christians of low, noble birth, who were easily tempted to try their luck in Lithuania. It was a scheme as ingenious as it was devious, and far from the holy mission that they spoke of publicly. 
After the Saracens ousted them from their holy land and stripped away their Middle Eastern estates, these Crusaders now planted their iron heels on our backs to sate their lust for blood and plunder. When Algirdas was forced to deal with the defiant city-states of Ruthenia wreaking havoc on the Lithuanian borderlands, the opportunistic Teutons saw a chance to invade our homeland yet again. Believing that western Lithuania lay open while Algirdas was occupied in the east, they marched into our lands. They were not expecting to face Kestutis, who had stayed behind to hold the heartland. But Kestutis was expecting them, and lay in wait, eager to teach these sword-swinging marauders a lesson. The Grand Master of the Order had greatly underestimated the resourceful brothers. It seemed that Algirdas and Kestutis were invincible whenever they joined forces. Exasperated, the Teutonic Order was forced to give up its invasion plans. At least for a time. The war with the Order was a long and bloody affair. But in the end, Kestutis repelled the invaders. He was thenceforth known as the Steadfast for his stubborn defense and loyalty to his brother. Once Algirdas arrived to help, the brothers even managed to conquer several important Teutonic fortresses. But their quick triumph made steadfast Kestutis careless. During a skirmish, retreating crusaders captured and dragged him to one of the Teutonic border fortresses. Perhaps the Crusaders even put chains on him, like those that we wear right now. I like to think that they did. But, in any case, Kestutis did not remain a prisoner for long. With the help of a loyal servant, he broke a hole in the three-meter-thick wall of his cell, while Algirdas distracted the Crusader guards with a feigned attack. In the chaos that ensued, Kestutis left the castle on horseback, dressed as a Teutonic knight. With the Crusaders licking their wounds, many expected Algirdas and Kestutis to finally clash over who should be the sole ruler of the country. Yet again, their unprecedented loyalty to one another kept the peace allowing the brothers to focus on expanding their realm. To the southeast of Lithuania lay the city-states of the former Rus. The Tatar yoke weighed heavily on these once flourishing cities. One hundred years of exorbitant tributes to the Golden Horde had bled them dry, while the Khans built golden palaces on the banks of the Volga. With the Horde weakened by internal disputes, many of the oppressed cities welcomed the Lithuanians as liberators. But some were not so eager to simply replace one overlord with another. The inhabitants of the newly independent city of Kiev saw the Lithuanians as the greater threat and sought an alliance with their former Tatar masters. A move that Algirdas and Kestutis would not leave unanswered. The Lithuanian army marched south with determination, storming the principalities of Chernigov and Pereslavl in quick succession. The brothers aimed to face the Golden Horde and its allies on the steppe. A bold move, and a tremendous risk that none had dared to take before. Despite their internal squabbles, the battle-hardened Tatar-mounted archers were still considered invincible. But Algirdas and Kestutis were determined to prove otherwise. We often call members of the Golden Horde Tatars, but in reality the Horde consists of a multitude of Turkic peoples. Among its ranks are flail-swinging riders from Volga, Bulgaria, Cumans from the Kipchok steppe, and Mongols from Siberia. Such a diverse crowd of peoples and cultures, all united 
in humiliating defeat at the hands of Algirdas. When the Lithuanian army moved south, crossing the Dnieper into Podolia, the bays of the Golden Horde scrambled to stop them. But it was to no avail. Armed with spears and swords, the Lithuanian soldiers broke the front lines of the Horde. The Tatars could not hold their formations and retreated in disarray, leaving their Khan no choice but to flee to the Crimea. The blood of horses and warriors slain by blade and arrow colored the dry grass of the steppe red. Algirdas' decisive victory established the Grand Duchy of Lithuania as a major power, bringing him both new friends and enemies. As the Golden Horde plunged towards a dishonorable end, the Rus principalities of Moscow and That was weird. Let's try it again. As the Golden Horde plunged towards a dishonorable end, the Rus principalities of Moscow and Tver emerged as the primary beneficiaries of its demise. While the Tatars quarreled with one another, these duchies had quietly grown into powerful states. The Grand Duchy of Moscow was ruled by a prince named Dmitri, who had succeeded in taking on the Khan of the Golden Horde through sly politics. Algirdas's recent territorial gains made him and Dmitri close neighbors, and the two men circled each other like wild beasts of prey, each waiting for the other to flinch. It was Algirdas who moved first. When Prince Mikhail of Tver sought Lithuanian aid against his Muscovite rivals, Algirdas found his long-awaited pretext. Together with the ever-loyal Kestutis, who was already showing signs of growing stale and impotent, he levied an army and marched on Dmitri's domains. The combined forces of Algirdas and Kestutis managed twice to penetrate into the heart of Moscow, but the walls of the Kremlin brought their advance to a halt each time. Its white limestone walls proved to be an impassable obstacle. Even Algirdas admitted that the Muscovite prince had constructed a military wonder. The war dragged on for years. Neither the Lithuanians nor the Golden Horde, which intervened late in the war, could force a decisive victory. In the end, the only remaining option was to sign a treaty that allowed all parties to return home without losing face. Keeping this peace was Algirdas' last great feat. For a man so shaped and defined by war, it was an odd end. But it meant that he died undefeated. We burned his corpse according to the old custom. On a ceremonial pyre with 20 of his beloved horses, and many of his favorite belongings. When the flames began to consume his lifeless body, I looked into the blaze in silence. My father had created an empire stretching from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. And I, Yogaila, would be his heir. When Lithuania was in dire straits, my father did not hesitate. He seized power and kept it. I tried to follow his example, and you can see where it has taken me. I aimed for the throne, yet I ended up in this dark, moldy prison cell. It was old, steadfast Kestutis who locked me up, calling me a traitor for coming to an understanding with our old enemy, the Teutonic Order. Yet he was the one who forced my hand. My father chose me as his successor. I was to rule with Kestutis the way that he had. 
But Kestutis no longer wanted to share his power. I admired him once, you know? He truly was the steadfast, a tempering influence on my father's bold, adventurous personality. But without Algirdas to animate him, Kestutis has turned into a stale, weary, reactionary leader. Now, Kestutis the stubborn clings to a throne that he no longer deserves. Like all weak rulers, he fears the younger generation. The chains on my hands prove that. But I will not be kept from my rightful inheritance. If any sense remained in that aging mind of his, he would know that my father's heart, that boisterous heart of a wild predator, also beats in my chest. And as befits the leader of a pack, I have loyal followers who will not let me rot forever in this dungeon. We have come a long way, foreigner. We met as strangers in a filthy dungeon. And now we stand together in the throne room of Vilnus. Wolves still surround Lithuania. Enemies that long for our downfall. But I shall not stray from the path down which I have started. I will rule as my father did. And one day, I shall surpass even him. Perhaps we will meet again, foreigner, if your travels ever bring you back here. But even if we do not, I have the feeling that this will not be the last time that you hear the name Yogaila, Grand Duke of Lithuania.